Hi, welcome. My name is Selena Morales, and I'm with the Southwest Folklife Alliance. And I'm going to be nuestra guía, our guide, for tonight's session on documenting ourselves, a folklife how-to. Dwayne, can you put up the next slide? Those of you that are joining that want to connect to our workshop in Spanish, um, para español, pueden uh, ir a esta dirección. You can go to this website. All right, you can move it back to me, Dwayne. Uh, I want to get us started tonight. Um, to begin with, uh, I am, like I said in the beginning, Selena Morales, and I am the lead folklorist with Southwest Folklife Alliance's um, Radical Imagination for Racial Justice Project. And to start out, I'm going to let you all know, uh, we're going to do a land acknowledgement. Out of respect for Native communities in recognition of the violent theft of their land and lifeways, and as a reminder to all of us that colonization is an ongoing process with Native lands still occupied, I want to acknowledge that I am sitting here tonight and joining you from Lenape land. I have appreciation and respect for the Lenape people and recognize that Philadelphia is just a small part of the vast territory that was taken from them. I invite you all in, on YouTube and on Facebook tonight to introduce yourselves, your name, and share um, whose land you work, live, and play on. In case you don't know, uh, we are gonna place in the chat a link to a website that can help you learn more about the place that you call home. And just thanks in advance for these responses. I feel it helps to bring awareness to the fuller truth of our histories and our homes, and in a small but personal way, uh, brings us towards reconciliation. Uh, tonight, we are also um, experiencing uh, some support around language. We have ASL interpretation and Spanish language interpretation. The entire Radical Imagination team shares a commitment to language justice which includes the right we all have to communicate and share our stories in our own languages. Language justice entails a commitment to creating multilingual spaces where everyone can show up as their whole selves and participate fully. Sometimes it looks like everyone participating in the same space, using the tools and practices, uh, and using practices of language justice in, and interpretation, which offers everyone an opportunity to be a part of the conversation equally. And sometimes like this afternoon or evening, depending on where you're calling in from, it looks like a presentation happening primarily in one language with interpreters who are working to include folks tonight in ASL in Spanish. Today's workshop is being interpreted in Spanish by Jen Hofer, Alexia Betia Rubio, and with live text translation by Katja Shata. They work for an, uh, Antenna Los Angeles, a collective dedicated to language justice and advocacy. Um, and I'll ask the folks monitoring the chats tonight to drop in their website, antennalosangeles.com, so that folks can check out more about their work. And tonight's ASL interpretation is being provided by Cynthia Norman. Thank you, Cynthia. This entire initiative that you've all stepped into by participating in one, two, or three of our workshops is connected to uh, a certain foundation initiative called the Radical Imagination for Racial Justice Initiative. And as a participant in this project, the Southwest Folklife Alliance is collaborating with the Othering and Belonging Institute and the Highlander Center for Research and Education to support participatory action research as part of a larger effort to work with artists, activists, and communities of color around the country to imagine a more just now. So I would like to roll now into the workshop, um, but to introduce you a little bit more to the Southwest Folklife Alliance, uh, I will call up Maribel Alvarez to join us.
Hello, everyone. It's a real pleasure to greet so many of you from all over the country. As you can see from my background, I'm uh, reaching you tonight from the beautiful Sonoran Desert uh, in Tucson, Arizona. This is the homeland of the Tohono O'odham people and the Pascuayaki people. And we are delighted to be part of this initiative and delighted that we can work with Selena across the country and with many of you in this um, new effort around uh, racial justice through the tools that we share in our um, toolbox. Um, the Southwest Folk Life Alliance is a relatively young organization. Uh, has been around for about six years, but it grows out of the work of more than four decades of a festival uh, that really brought together the ethnic communities of Tucson in the 19, early 1970s. Uh, Tucson Meet Yourself. The festival was a platform that grew in many directions of participatory action research, publications, economic development for traditional artists. So at the time that we formed the Alliance, uh, we realized that more could be done specifically around work uh, on the border corridor in promoting um, traditional art forms, uh, unsung heroes of everyday beauty and communities that had their own enclaves, their own sense of identity, but that were not necessarily um, visible in the public sphere in quite the same way. So the Alliance works across the spectrum of traditional arts in community settings, in community development, neighborhood design, organizing, food justice. Uh, we have a publication that we publish every month uh, called Border Lore, and it is an electronic journal. And right now we are running a whole series on the relationship of climate change with traditional knowledge. Um, and there is a sense of expansion about the work that belongs in folk life. I think that it's something that motivates us, that is intersectoral, cross-sectoral, that is about rethinking how the everyday uh, expressions of beauty get into the mix, into the water of communities' um, efforts to mobilize, to organize, to speak for themselves. So, of course, there's a lot more information about all our programs uh, and our themes in the website, Southwest Folk Life. And um, we just want to thank um, the CERNA Foundation and all the other partners for making room for folklorists in the mix of this uh, work, uh, folklorists um, who deal with that stuff that um, was um, sometimes uh, referred to as something very, very much in the past and then sort of updated uh, for the contemporary reality. So people who have to dig deep to find a sense of um, of persistence in, 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 uh, and of survival and of more than that, of thriving in their own communities and sometimes uh, fighting for the right to be seen, to be noticed and to be part of this um, American story. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Selena. Thank you, Janine. And we look forward to a wonderful program tonight. Blessings to everyone for our, from our little corner of the world. Thanks, Maribel. Um, that was a perfect setup for a bit of an orientation for you all around uh, folk life and how it connects to participatory action research. So like I said before, um, you've been kind of perhaps part of this ride of three different um, webinar series, giving you a sense about how to begin um, ethical and effective research practices within your own community. Um, and tonight we're going to talk a little bit about how the folk life framework or the folk life perspective um, will help advance some of these um, research efforts. So here on our first slide, and I'm really excited to introduce to the world tonight um, a new series of illustrations made by Kate Morales. Um, and we're going to use them as a way to talk a little bit about 
um, the framing of our work. So this first one, um, we, the Southwest Folklife Alliance, brings a folklorist framework to participatory action research. Um, so we're gonna, we'll get a little bit deeper into this in a moment, but just this idea that um, looking at folk and traditional arts, community-based culture, the kind of assets that are within communities um, is, a, is, a, is a starting place and, and often a, a deep um, uh, supportive place uh, to begin looking into uh, community knowledge and community um, uh, values. We can go to the next slide. So participatory action research offers for us a flexible framework. What do we mean by participatory? It means that it, the research must include the people who are impacted by the issue at hand. The, the people that are most impacted by the issue are at the center of the research process. And as part of this webinar series, we've heard that um, stated over and over again, and it comes directly from a working definition of participatory action research, but forward by Highlander. Um, and I think it's absolutely right on. The notion of action here, we are saying that da data is gathered for the purpose, for a purpose that is identified by the people impacted by the issue at hand. So through participatory action research, no one comes in um, from the outside with an agenda. The, the action and the activity of the research is grounded in the people who are participants in that community, however they define the community. And the purpose of it and the impact, the issues are um, navigated and defined by the community. And we certainly heard Tamisha Walker Torres talking about that at the last session. The last we'll delve into here is the word research. And we wanna point out that a wide range of methods can be used um, to do this research, um, but the research must be led by, the, by a community-centered practice so that methodologies and approaches to research are coming from the practice already embedded within the community. Next slide. Uh, some of the core ethical principles of our research practice um, are, and I'll read the headings first, not top-down, not fixed, not extractive, not appropriative. So um, the research is really coming from the grassroots and from the community. Nothing about us without us is for us. It is not fixed. That means that folk life is happening now. It is alive. It is future facing. Just because it's written down and recorded or on video doesn't mean that its meaning, its context, its relevancy doesn't continue to change. Not extractive. Um, that the information gathered enhances a community. It's additive. It doesn't leave the community without purpose or without permission and it's not appropriative. Ownership of the research is retained by the community and by the participants. Information, again, is not leaving the community. You can go to the next slide. Other common names for our methods. So you may hear um, our research methods um, talked about in a lot of different ways. Here are some that resonate with us. Community-based ethnography, looking around our home place to see what, who, where, why, and how, and documenting it. Critical inquiry, information gathered from multiple perspectives to learn something new about ourselves, our community, and our assumptions. And here the multiple perspectives is very important. Communities are not homogenous. The information that people have about how they live their lives and what their needs are varies, could vary day to day, it could vary person to person. And so really spending the time to understand the multiple perspectives that exist within a community. Socially engaged research. Knowledge production and interpretation occurs through social systems. Data gathered comes from multiple perspectives and is interpreted together. So I think right there in the title, this idea of socially engaged, the research process is constantly part of relationships that are valued and that will continue 
beyond the research. And then grassroots data gathering, community-driven, community-relevant methods, not brought to the community from the outside. And that connects back to the, um, to the slide before us as well, connected to our ethical principles. You can advance to the next slide. So here are some of the ways of knowing. Um, I love this one. Uh, what, what we might find within communities, what, what information, where are there nodes of research? <laughs> We're hoping that we'll find socially engaged knowledge, knowledge that is held, held and built through social networks, traditional knowledge, ways of knowing and being usually passed down orally from one generation to the next, and community scholarship, ways of learning and teaching that is grounded in community members participating with one another. Can continue to the next slide. This is a wonderful quote from Marie Bell that helps to illuminate um, the kinds of things that we're focusing on through the Southwest Folklife Alliance. A folklife lens helps us see beauty and complexity in things that others overlook. The hand movements in making tortillas, the bedroom of an elder, the speech of a teenager, the hand tool of a gardener, the lyrics of a protest song. So within any of these types of expressive culture, we, there is so much to learn about community and about the issues at, at the center of our participatory action research inquiries. And I wanna leave, um, leave you all with on the next slide. Um, a statement about folk life and its relevancy to addressing racism and bias. When we pay attention to folk life, we pay attention to creative ways that people act in community, make meaning together, and express their collective ethics, morals, and values. To use a folk life strategy in research is to center the cultural expressions of consequence to a community. The tools and principles used in a folk life strategy help practice and fortify critical community processes, which we believe build towards liberation, self-determination, and shifts power to everyday people. So I'm gonna move on to the next slide, which is around our learning objectives for tonight. Dwayne, you can go ahead and advance us. Um, we're gonna invite Janine Osayande to be joining us in just a moment. Um, Janine and I are going to be talking with you all around these four topics. Uh, naming, examining community news sources. And how do we find out what's going on where we live? We're gonna identify methods of documentation of community events. And then through a case study, we'll consider impacts of producing community-centered documentation. And then if we have time at the end, and I, I promise we'll follow up through um, resources in our shared resource document, um, we'll introduce some ideas about archives and where to place our community-centered documentation. So I'd like to invite Janine Osayande, representing the historically black neighborhood of Swarthmore, Pennsylvania, to join me. Hi, Janine. Hi, Selena, how are you? Hi, I'm great. Glad to see you tonight. Thank you. Um, I just wanna note that I don't see the slides. The screen is frozen for me. Okay, we see you. Okay. And um, we will roll with it, Janine, okay? Let's roll, okay. All right. Um, so the first conversation that we wanted to have was um, with you all is around community news sources and how you all figure out what's going on in your community. How do you share news with each other? Um, for me, I'm gonna just share two ways right now. Um, the first way is I go outside and I chat with Miss Jackie. Miss Jackie has the house on the corner of Locust and Melville Street in, in Philly. And she's out there, you know, pretty much the whole day, every day, welcoming the day, welcoming everybody as they come out of their houses, making sure nobody's parked illegally in front of anyone's block. And she also is helping us register to vote and connect 
to issues in our particular neighborhood. And so Miss Jackie is my, my neighborhood news source. I also um, hate to admit this, but I use Facebook. Um, I've really curated my Facebook feed to be focused on receiving news and information around the world from people that I really value. And I don't use it so much for a social network, but instead as a place to connect to news stories that are um, paramount and consequential in my neighborhood, in my city, um, and around the world. What about you, Janine? Hi, Selena. Thank you. Um, my first news source is the front porch. Uh, I live in the historically black neighborhood of Swarthmore, and on my very small street, um, just maybe 10 houses, right in the center is Aunt Dars on my father's side. And we gather as, as long as the weather is, is bearable, everyone will gather and sit on her porch um, almost daily. And that's one of the ways we collect uh, the very local news of what's going on. But another source is in the town of Swarthmore. Um, we have a very small local newspaper. And more recently, they have two new editors, two young editors who have brought a fresh uh, approach to the news in Swarthmore. And one of them is my uh, daughter in love. And, and it's the first African American editor that they've ever had. So we're getting um, very strong news from many directions now. Awesome. Uh, so that leads us to, to really asking the question to everyone, where do you get your news? Dwayne, can you bring up slide 10? Thank you. Oh, next one. Yeah. Thank you. So we, every community, everywhere, people, definitely the question is, how does your community share with one another what's going on? There's so many places at a grocery store, at a soccer field, um, right on the corner, as we mentioned. But we have a couple of questions. The first, do you go to multiple places and cite sources to learn what's happening in your community and what's happening in your region, your state, and your nation? Have you read a story about your community that surprised you or made you feel curious about the source or motivation? I know I have. And then number three, what points of view or opinions or whose voices would you like to hear more of in your community? So we'd like you to take some time, about six minutes, and begin to write down the responses. You could write as many as you would like, but at least one to answer the questions that are posted. Thank you.
you call that? Sure. All right. All right. So thank you um, for engaging in that exercise. I'm curious about um, what are some of the places where you all find out what's going on where you live. Uh, if you could please use the chat um, and let us know where, where do you find out what's going on? And if you could label your, your, um, your contribution with either local, regional, national, or community, it would be helpful for us to see um, if you have different news sources for these different kinds of information. So while you're participating, I just wanted to um, remind folks that we're talking here about participatory action research. And so while this is a session about documentation, um, I think a really important first step in approaching a documentation project is to find out how people will listen to what you have documented, how people will experience what you have to say. And so starting in a place where, you, where you're of inquiry, where you are talking to your neighbors and finding out about their community news sources will help you connect um, your important documentation efforts to people. I want to just um, take a pause for a technical issue. Um, Dwayne, um, we need some interpreter. Alexia needs to be let back into the uh, Zoom. Thank you. So we can have the next slide, please. So we're curious about what kinds of documentation tools you feel are available to you. I've made a very kind of easy and maybe low hanging fruit list here. Um, we have a camera and cell phones and audio recorders, as well as video. All of these can all be accessed through a cell phone these days. So um, kind of all one category here and kind of a no brainer, right? People just turn on and start recording. But I'm also curious about other methods of recording what's happening. Um, storytelling. How do you use storytelling and retelling to document what's happening in your community? How might you use pen and paper to draw, to write, um, to record in different ways? There are apps that you can use for documenting your community. Uh, muralists can paint pictures that tell stories about what's going on. Songwriting, quilting. We saw in the early images um, of participatory action research that I shared, um, there were folks making a quilt um, and sewing in uh, BLM, Black Lives Matters, into a, a quilt. So we see ways of engaging in different kinds of art forms that can share messages. What about you all? Can you add also here in the chat, share what are, what are documentation tools that are available to you right now? So um, Dwayne, you can put Janine and I back up. Janine and I have been working together for more than 10 years. And um, I invited Janine to participate here tonight because the story she has to tell about her work documenting her own community um, is inspiring, it's heroic, 
And it's a journey that I have participated in. I feel honored to have participated in it. Um, and I have loved watching Janine push forward with her documentation efforts. And I think that everyone has a lot to learn from sharing with one another about these kinds of efforts. And so I'd love for us to take some time now to hear about Janine and her historically black neighborhood in Swarthmore. Well, I'm, I've been inspired since I was a really small girl, uh, ear hustling, listening to the elders and just collecting you know, stories sitting under them. But I am from a historically black neighborhood, uh, which means it was segregated at one point. Um, and in our neighborhood, there are certain customs, traditions that just was a way of life. We didn't think anything of it, you know, out inside of the bigger town that we lived in of Swarthmore. But on my journey, there are several things that that helped me to arrive at this place. Um, so one of them is being where I'm from. The, the historically black neighborhood of Swarthmore, seven generations. I have grandchildren that make up that seventh generation. But I, as the expression goes, I got it from my mama. Um, in, in just growing up and following her around, she had a thirst back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, up until recently her transition uh, to record the stories. She did it in a way um, that was just a natural neighborhood way, uh, but it inspired me to want to go in further and go to a next level. So I began about 10 years ago, as Selena mentioned, seeking out tools, uh, seeking out knowledge, seeking out skills that would help me to do a better job at uh, gathering our stories, gathering our oral history. Um, and through that, I um, came into working with the Philadelphia Folklore Project um, about 10 years ago, they had a folk life documentation workshop, and it really trained us well for about a nine month to a 12 month period, uh, the cohorts. Um, and that really began my journey. Um, from there, there was a project I worked on with Scribe Video. Uh, in this particular project, it's called Precious Places. It allowed us to, again, go into our communities to document our stories. But with Precious Places, I um, was able to invite in uh, multiple people. So I think we had at least 15 to 20 people on our team. And this team that included, for example, my uncle who was in his 80s and one of my aunts, um, it included them to have leadership roles. So through Precious Places, we were again able to, to have this effort of going in and researching and documenting and even being trained on how to do it, our community and to be able to tell our story. Um, a highlight for me is seeing my Aunt Doris, who's the director. Most people would think because of my personality that I would just be in charge of everything, but I took a back seat in this particular project. Uh, I was engaged, but that back seat. So it was very powerful to have her be the director and my uncle who was in his 80s to learn about the video cameras and actually be our videographer. Um, it, it, it even today continues on of, of what that empowerment meant to the community down to having um, my daughter-in-law or my children also being part of that and other neighbors. Um, that leads us to where we are. And I'd like to now share with you um, just a promo that was done on Precious Places about our neighborhood. So I'd like you to now just sit back, uh, take a watch, and meet my community. Dwayne, can you bring up the video?
Some 6 to 7 million African Americans participated in the Great Migration. Black folks who came up north to Swarthmore came from Delaware, Maryland, and Virginia. Our neighborhood came to exist because blacks in Swarthmore, like their peers across the Northeast, were forced to live where whites would allow them to live. But in the tradition of black creativity, we took these contours and made it our own. We created a home place. I, I was born here, right here, and I'm not going to move anywhere. <laughs> Go anywhere. <laughs> My grandfather, his father, built this place. And this was called Jones Hall. At that time, different clubs would come and have meetings. Baseball club, mm -hmm. the women's organizations and everything used to come here. After that, the church. It's where the Wesley Church started, right here and here, right here in this house. And then they moved down here and built that church in 1927. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a Church was like a focal point. There was no question in the world about getting up in the morning and saying, okay, we know what you got to do. Sunday school's at 9.30, you know, <laughs> you know. My fondest memories of growing up in Swarthmore right here where I'm sitting at this church step because of as a child of all the wonderful things we did through the church. The picnics, the parties, the block parties, the uh, hay rides, the friendship, and need, needless to say the spirituality that was given to me as a young person. When I was younger, it was, it was, it was a community that was ex exceedingly... We'll see if this will come back in, and if not, we'll move along. But the good news is there'll be a link where people can watch it at another time if it doesn't show up. Greetings. The video is buffering and we're going to see if we can bring it back up. But the good news is, if uh, we're not able for this particular video to show it now, it will be in the link. Um, you'll, you'll receive that information. Okay. Well, as I mentioned, my mother had inspired me to do the work and she was one of the people that you kind of saw in the video sitting on the church steps with the short haircut. Um, but we are excited to show it to you and, and you know how technology is. So um, if not now, in just a moment, but I'm gonna pass it back to Selena and we'll move forward. So uh, Janine, actually, I would love for you to next intro your latest project. Um, let's see, in early June, I called Janine and I had seen a flyer <laughs> going around on my Facebook feed where I get my community news um, about a gathering that Janine was hosting in her community uh, to celebrate Juneteenth. And uh, for a long time, I've been wanting to go to a gathering in Janine's community. Um, every year they have a celebration for 4th of July that I had missed for the past decade. <laughs> Apologies. Um, and again, I was out of town for this one. And so I, I gave Janine a call and I said, you know, I, I think it's really important that we uh, work together on a documentation project um, specifically so that we could share the experience with you all tonight. Um, and I knew Janine was already connected to and interested in doing her community documentation. So I gave her an assignment. The assignment was to take 
10 photographs that would document her experience hosting her community's Juneteenth celebration and Black Lives Matter protests and to take up to two videos. And then to spend some time reflecting on what can we see in these photographs and what does this video tell us about the historically black neighborhood in Swarthmore at this time? So that's me setting you up, Janine, for your project. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we, we began with the elders. Um, when Juneteenth was approaching, well, as Selena said in the past, we would celebrate 4th of July, not really because it was on 4th of July, but because it was a day off. Uh, so the neighborhood would get together and we had a block party with upwards to 250 people. Over the last four or five years, we started pulling back from it and thinking about how can we re-celebrate being together in a block party. And so the idea that we should just shift it from July 4th to Juneteenth came up. Um, but then we had COVID this year, so we decided, all right, we won't, we won't put out the tables, we won't have our 250 people. Uh, but then George Floyd happened and Breonna Taylor happened. And people all around the world were bringing their voices to, to this tragedy and the tragedy that's been happening. So we started talking in our community and finding out that the elders wanted to have a march um, and wanted to honor Juneteenth and to do it uh, in Unity Park, which is right at the foot of our street. Um, also the location of where a uh, segregated school used to sit. But anyway, we went to the elders, spoke to them. They decided, yes, we want to do this. We got their permission. And within probably less than two weeks, um, myself and several other people, along with our elders, uh, organized a Juneteenth observance um, and Black Lives Matter rally. Um, it was really important to see everyone, um, not just in our neighborhood, but in our community. A side note was that we heard that there were some folks that were gonna do a Juneteenth that weren't black, which is, well, we invited them to be allies. We invited them to come and join us instead. So Dwayne, could you bring up our video? And it looks at the emphasis I would say would be not just the Juneteenth and not just um, the Black Lives Matter, but for, for myself and for my community, how do we have a voice to talk about what's important to us in our community? How do we tell our story? I am from the Great Migration, the historically Black neighborhood of Swarthmore, with family roots seven generations strong. Um, I want to do a traditional ceremony. Uh, it's a ceremony called libation, which is done in many parts of Africa. It is a non-religious celebration of our ancestors. And in Africa, ancestors are very important because it's a saying that we stand on the shoulders of the people that come before us. So Kemet, Ashe. Ashe. Nubia, Ashe. Ashe. Sanghai, Ashe. Ashe. Mali, Ashe. Ashe. Abyssinia, Ashe. Ashe. We want to pour next to what we call the great Ma'afa. Ma'afa is a Swahili word, and that word means the, the disaster. It is paramount that we document our community to preserve alternative, aka black, aka fuller history, culture, and practices necessary to Swarthmore's community's well-being and justice. Personally, documenting our Juneteenth observance and Black Lives Matter protest was difficult. 
I was also an organizer and co MC. I had to jump in and out of roles and responsibilities quickly, and I didn't want to appear shallow. Still, it was important for me to personally record our community Juneteenth and Black Lives Matter protest. Like the second principal of Kwanzaa, Kuji Chagalia, self-determination, we must define ourselves, name ourselves, create for ourselves, and speak for ourselves. You see, longtime Black community members whose family roots date back before the incorporation of Swarthmore and after are experiencing the effects of gentrification and loss of certain cultural norms and traditions. More, the borough of Swarthmore has a sordid history of systemic racism. Like America, Swarthmore has practiced racism in the educational system, the government, recreational access, and housing, to name a few. I believe my neighborhood is at a critical juncture in 2020. The original black members from the historically black neighborhood of Swarthmore are far and few between. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. As a documentarian, I can record and produce our local stories from our voices. Our community local news stories are America's news stories. Still, I wonder why some Swarthmore Borough community members don't know about our historically black neighborhood or that we ever existed. They didn't know until the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the upsurge of Black Lives Matter protests this summer. 200 years from now, I want folks to know that we were here and we added value to our community and the borough of Swarthmore since its incorporation. Black Lives Matter. lovely Janine. Thank you Selena. When I'm so looking at the videos I'm thinking about how um, in the assignment that you gave me um, how difficult it was <laughs> as I mentioned to try to be in something but the importance of capturing it and having to uh, just in looking at it make um, some pretty quick decisions that in the beginning in the middle and the end that I knew with having to do 20, although I did 30, um, that, you know, how I had to space it and what was presented, but what wasn't. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, that secondary process, which I was really excited about. I knew you would take a lot of pictures and I gave you a limit only to alleviate the pressure of, of needing too much. Yeah. And um, I think, you know, in, in last week's workshop, um, Tamisha, who I learned so much from, really talked about the importance of really being able to kind of cut to say, like, you know, I have way too much here. Like, I can only manage and deal with this amount of data right now or this amount of information. Um, and so I think that's what we were trying to do in giving you just 10, just 10 snapshots, 10 moments that will represent the experience that you had at an event that you are recording 
for your record. And I wanted to know about what the process of reviewing that material was like for you, going back and looking at your 30 pictures um, and, and the couple videos that you snapped um, and reflecting on what did they mean? What were the treasures in there? What were the stories that only you knew inside those videos? Thank you. Um, I initially felt that I didn't capture enough um, because I wasn't maybe looking deeply into the images that I did capture. And so my first approach was, what don't I have instead of what do I have? Once I switched to what do I have, I, uh, well, initially I did put all 30 slides in. I used Ken Burns and they were zooming in and out. And then I thought that if people who weren't there in the moment and in the neighborhood are really trying to understand what's happening, they really need to see and we need to give them time to see. And so in that, I took the 30 slides that I had and narrowed them back down. I'd say probably closer to 20, not 10, but 20, and started looking at each frame. And I, I, I'd probably say in terms of editing, I had at least 10 different editing sessions, like where I'd sit down for a couple of hours and go through it and then sit down maybe for an hour, go back for a couple of hours. But what I was looking for in the photo was not always what's right in front of the frame, but who's sitting around, uh, who's supporting around the frames and what activities or what messages could we find. So the things that stood out to me is by actually trying to get closer to what the assignment was to have less, that in having less, um, the story really began to unfold for me. Um, in that, I looked at both what happened, as I said, just in the, the timeline of it, in the beginning of the march and um, Juneteenth to the middle to the end, but the vignettes of things uh, th that were packed inside. So what I found was when I took a picture of, there was a picture of a mom that folks might have seen with a turquoise shirt where she's like this. And when we had our moment of silence and her son were on their knees, I was able to look at that image, but then go back and look at not what's just in front and the story that's being told by who I see there, but right behind to, to re-edit the images and in re-editing them, just take parts of it. So in the, in our in the presentation that I have, what I'm doing is taking a full photo that we see, but then in that full photo, reusing it at least two other times, one or two other times, so that we could see what's happening around those people in the moment. And I found that to be really important. Um, I also found something that was significant was that you don't need a lot and that you have to accept it. Like right in the beginning, I already knew that there are things I'm going to miss. And again, with my personality, I had to just calm myself and remind myself that whatever I capture, th I did capture what was happening and that we can't possibly capture it all. But in capturing the small amounts, it can trigger you to think about everything and think about what was there and what wasn't there. Yeah, I think that's great. We're, we're not really advocating to document less, but I think right. what we are advocating for is to see all that lies in your documentation. Um, I'm reminded of some uh, participatory action research projects that I've, um, I've done, I've collaborated in, where we've taken hundreds of photographs and put them around a room, like a gallery, and invited community members back in to take a look at those photographs and tell us one story that no one else would know that's part of that photograph. Mm -hmm. And um, I've used that approach a couple of times. And the the number of people within the same community that pick the exact same photo but tell a completely different story really illuminated for me, um, and, and as does your, your video piece, um, how rich 
documentation is. It's not necessarily about taking hundreds of pictures, but taking the time to explore the stories that are in each of the, um, the records that we're keeping. Yes, yes. Um, I wanted to ask you another question. Um, and I also wanna invite folks who have questions for Janine um, or for me to use the chat feature in Facebook or YouTube and um, or being supported tonight by Nelda and Leah who will shoot those chats over to us um, so we can address your questions. Um, Janine, earlier you had mentioned about your mother doing documentation work to some extent um, over her lifetime as uh, being a resident in the neighborhood. And um, this is now a passion that you have undertaken. And I know that a lot of your community has also participated as documentarians with you. Um, and then your daughter in love, who is now taking the work um, to the news. Um, just wanted to hear a little bit about that kind of line of impact, how um, carrying on this, this passion and this tradition of documentation is impacting your neighborhood and, and wider the community at Swarthmore. Thank you. When I first started to document I, and, and go to elders, for example, um, one of the things I noticed after I, I would you know, sit with them and get their stories is when I would see them in the public, I kind of get the nod. And it was a nod that I realized I didn't have before. Um, but the nod really came from the fact that when you just, for me to sit down with an individual or with a group and be able to just say what, what you have to say and who you are is really important. And it's so significant that we need to record this, we need to preserve it and that you living your life uh, provides examples and adds value to other lives that are lived. Um, for me, it's like I'm hungry to document. Like I always want to get a story or I'm always thinking about how do we do this. And I think probably one of the biggest reasons is when we, we although my mom began doing this journey um, and before her, John Polk, an elder from the neighborhood who encouraged her to do it, we still would find that you just, we couldn't find that much information written about our neighborhood and our community when they're writing about Swarthmore or videos about Swarthmore. Um, and so the the desire to, to tell our story to, um, that began, I would tell you, when I was a child with obituary box, like a box of obituaries that um, when some of the elders would pa really pass away, they, my mom has like box, huge box of obituaries and we would go through and read them so that we would know who people, you know, who are these people and 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 why do they matter? Why is it significant? But to see a journey where we're just talking about the stories, beginning to write and record them uh, from the obituaries to that, to where we are now, um, it speaks to the power that each person, um, no matter who you are and where you are in your life or your circumstance, that you can stand up and you can write your story. You can record your story both for you and for your community and that you don't have to wait for other people to do it. And I think maybe we were waiting for other people to do it. And in some ways they have. But what we began to also find that when you have other people writing about you or recording and documenting who you are, there's only so much they'll be able to tell. They're not going to, they're not in you. Right. So they just they're not in your eyes. They're not in your head. They're not in your experiences. They're not in your life. They're not on your dinner plate. Um, so there's only so much they could do. And it's really driven me even more because in the neighborhood that we live in, it's become very gentrified. Um, we grew up where you knew every house like there's three blocks and every single street you knew every single human being and their pets that lived in that house. And now I can go through my neighborhood and not know people. So in not knowing people, it's also, will our stories not be known if now we're, we're in this new place? Um, so this journey for me uh, from 
you know, being a child and looking at boxes of obituaries that travels us to the Juneteenth more recently um, is a desire um, of just the power of being able and knowing that each person can tell their story. Um, and nowadays we have we have our devices. We have we have our devices. We have you know we even have a, a flower garden. You could plant a vegetable garden, and that could tell your story. So there's so many ways that that we can can speak about who we are and the importance of it. Oh, Janine, there's so much I want to pick up on what you just said. Um, we had a participation a little bit earlier around. Um, around how do we find out what's going on in our communities and how are we connecting to those stories um, by our dear friend Madhu Bora, who is a dancer here in Philadelphia. Um, and Janine is also uh, a dancer. And the comment that she made was about the body as archive, right? And just a way of recording and experiencing um, the world around us and documenting it and communicating back to people um, through your body. And so I wanted to throw that in there um, because you were talking about just now, like living it and being part of it and eating it and um, walking it. Um, there was another comment earlier, too, about um, the idea of learning about what's going on by walking, by walking through your community. And, um, you know, I'm just letting my imagination wander in terms of the routes that you normally take and then what happens if you walk that route a different way. Um, yeah. What kinds of learning and recording and documenting can you do in that way? So those are somewhat metaphorical and about embodying experience, but I think that it's important to expand um, our sense of how we are recording what happens. Yes. Um, and, and so I see you doing that in some ways. Um, I also want to pick up on this idea of archive that you just introduced. Um, with the obituary box, it sounds incredible. Um, <laughs> and um, I sit around and I do. I just sit around reading them, like even recently, <laughs> and getting to know people. Yeah. Yeah, and I think the newspaper clipping, right? Um, thinking about sh how people communicate with one another by sharing newspaper clippings and and things like that. Um, we'll we'll get a little bit more into archives in a few minutes, but there is a question. Um, here. This question is, what is at risk when you are not documenting your community's stories and how to use those stories to change policy? This question comes from Leah. So mm -hmm. what happens if, if you don't document what's going on in your community, Janine, and, and how might documenting your community impact policy um, in your borough? Well, for me, by, by not documenting when you're gone, it's that you didn't even exist. And it's, it's important, um, because for me, it's important that in 200 years or in 300 years that, that people knew we were here because it, we're part of Swarthmore's story, but we're part of America's story. And there is that history of where, like living in a, a desegregated neighborhood, historically black neighborhood, um, that people have, I would say in our community had the luxury of not writing about us or talking about us, or that it really isn't until now that you're really getting an interest with the black, the interest in Black Lives Matter, that we're getting a lot of, there, there are people who always were about it and knew it, uh, but we're talking the folks who, who weren't tuned in. Um, in terms of policy in documenting, um, you, we could look at things like even how houses are taxed in our neighborhood. So even in us documenting stories, we have a story how my 80 year old Aunt Sylvia got on like eight SEPTA buses to go to to like a meeting and um, and discovered that how they tax houses in our neighborhood for one property uh, would be the same as six houses that a realtor, a white realtor owned in, in the same neighborhood. And it hasn't switched a policy yet, but it's gotten people to know, you know, by documenting, by telling these stories, now she has passed. But 
you know, Delaware County is reassessing property values, that that particular story is an important one that I tell our borough, that we begin to tell people who can make change that what, what's going on here. And this is something that she just figured out. It, it wasn't really public, but she figured it out in talking. But then it became a story that we held on to even after she left. Um, and now it's being brought right back to the to the, the folks who are making decisions of what are you going to do now? Thanks. Um, we have another question here um, from Michelle. Um, for community members that have felt silenced, what strategies would you recommend to reach out to them that have been jaded by these past unpleasant experiences? Now, when we say past, what do we pass unpleasant experiences? So I think that um, if there's community members that have felt silenced by um, forces within the community or perhaps in the city, what strategies would you recommend to reach out to them, to connect to people, to be able to hear their stories? I, I guess I would go back to that, to the recording of it, that, that we, we don't have to just turn on a television and have the, the news tell us what to do or open a newspaper and have those sources. Um, so just by recording those stories and then broadcasting those stories and sharing them with others is one of the ways that they can get it out. Um, even in the people that we've worked with, there were some folks like there's a neighbor now where we're going to do a new initiative. And I know she's quite shy and her her voice, she keeps it silent. Um, so I do like the idea in that list, Selena, that you had earlier, that not just in, in maybe recording it, but in quilts, in food, um, in, in the clothing and how we dress, there are many different ways that we could still get our story out and get our voice out. Yeah, and I'm gonna add on to that as well. I think that um, you know all of this work um, is really being built on a foundation of trust that needs to be present before documentation can happen, before critical questions can be developed, and before an examination of our shared and common assets um, can be uh, connected to. So, you know, going back even to the very first workshop in this series. Um, and so I think starting with some kind of activities like the one about community news sources that we just led um, allows you to learn what's important to those community members that perhaps feel silent um, and ask, asks them to say, well, when have I been curious about how I'm represented, right? That's a question that opens up a dialogue, that opens up a conversation so that you can um, kind of address that response and decide together whether you want to be documenting one another's stories. Thank you. Um, I'm going to continue with some other questions from our participants now, if that's all right, Janine. Yay. All right. Um, this one's for you directly, Janine, um, from Adriana Camarena. Uh, in documenting your stories in storytelling, but especially in editing, what helps you select key moments or highlights? One of the, well, I look for common themes. So when I'm, when I'm documenting, I look at what keeps reoccurring, what, you know, if it's, if it's documenting several people, I'm listening for, for almost what's the table of contents. Uh, like what, what do I keep hearing over and over? Um, and I, I become attracted to, to those stories and just start to whittle it down to, oh. So in some cases you, you go in knowing what you want. Usually you're gonna go in thinking you know what you want, but you have to be open so that it could be revealed to you. Um, I also, as a dancer, um, in, in looking at it and in documenting, look for a look for a certain flow, a certain um, ebb and flow that that tends to show itself. So even in working in this video, it, I changed it around at least nine, ten different times, and each time I engage with the material, the material also speaks to me and helps me to to reveal what is important. 
I want to also talk a little bit, um, you and I both, about resourcing this work. Um, you know, compensating people for their time, um, finding the equipment that we need, um, figuring out archival processes or how we're going to um, save the materials that we have collected. Um, so can you give some ideas about how you've resourced it or you know, whether it's been well-resourced, under-resourced, shoestring? Um, what is that, what have resources, um, financial resources and community resources been like in your projects? It's been all the above. Um, recently, I just received a grant <laughs> um, that is actually going to, be, we're going to begin the process again, an Ann Bernstein Rich Hand um, Peace Fund. And this uh, particular fund is going to allow us to have storytelling circles, allow us to be able to create um a record both where we'll have a recordings and then we can put it up as a podcast. Uh, we're, we're in conversations with the Philadelphia Folklore Project for them to team up and work with me to help me to do that type of work. Um, that probably is probably one of my my more recent resources. Otherwise, it's it's a passion that I have and this desire to document, record. Uh, our community. So I just do it. Like I just go out and I do it. Um, earlier, I mentioned again, the Folklore Project and I mentioned Scribe. So those have been, you know, some of the outlets. Uh, recently with um, People's Light, which is located in Malvern, Pennsylvania, a theater company, I was commissioned to do some work and was able to share um some oral history stories, one story called The Birthday Party about growing up in Swarthmore. But for me, uh, I haven't always written grants. I'm, I'm more coming into writing grant, beginning to write grants to do this work. But up to this point, um, it was either being invited into, you know, applying to be in a project to do the work or just going out and investing my own time and my own money. Thanks. And I think that, um, so Janine and I are both in the Philadelphia area. There are a number of uh, organizations that focus on media and documentation here, nonprofit organizations. And so we have both benefited by um, working with those organizations who are already invested and in applying for grants and, um, and uh, receiving donations that are focused on uplifting community documentation. Um, and so a lot of our work has been advanced, um, as Janine said, through the Philadelphia Folklore Project, Scribe Video Center. Can uh, I just add, I'm sorry, Selena. Um, more recently, I do have this thought because, of, well, my mom recently passed and a lot of people in the community are asking, um, what can we do or, or just can we help? And I am thinking, you know, I'm thinking about this idea that to, in continuing the work that people could make donations, <laughs> you know, not to me personally, but to an organization that that would run it. But but really thinking about even in my families, if it's a birthday party or different events that people can start, you know, using their funds and donate, not maybe buying a plastic toy or buy the plastic toy, but also thinking about just community members, family members of how can we invest in it ourselves. Oh, your mom would love that. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about saving our work, um, saving our documentation, um, ensuring that it's accessible to other individuals who can benefit from the telling or retelling of our stories and also holding that work, you know, so that it, we're accountable to the stories that, um, that we've recorded and that they don't get misused. Uh, after tonight's workshop, I'll be sharing a list of resources, um, three of which are focused on community archives. And, uh, Two are examples of repositories that um, are doc that are are open to the public to submit documentation of movements um, that are happening right now in our communities. 
And um, each of those websites are really comprehensive in their um, explanation about the use and the um, process of documenting your own um, stories and, and experiences. A third is a really interesting uh, entry, which is archivists who are, have collaborated in the Philadelphia region around supporting the documentation of black lives and black experience in, in the region. And um, I point folks to that as inspiration for your own neighborhood, community, regional archiving effort. Um, and the website that, uh, that we'll be sharing on that resource list really outlines um, the steps that folks can take to participate in uh, either building their own support system for this kind of archival work um, or participating regionally in Philadelphia in, in um, expanding the use of archives. A, one more question has come in <laughs> uh, from Thomas. As someone who does folk life documentation from an outsider's perspective, usually funded by state arts agencies, is there any role for partnerships between inside and outsider documentarians? So um, this question is about whether uh, professional documentarians or folklorists like myself, if there's a role for collaboration with insider documentarians like Janine. Oh, I'm an insider. <laughs> <laughs> I think so in this question. <laughs> what do you think, Janine? Let me, sorry, I have to look at it again. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. like. Well, yeah, there's a role. Uh, we need you. <laughs> um, we need all sides and all angles. Yeah, we need every, we need everybody. Um, but definitely, um, that role for, for, for partnership. I, I would say there are more people out there who would want to do these partnerships than we know who are living in communities and are fearing that their, um, this content, this life that they're living, these experiences are just going to disappear and not be recorded and, and be archived or be saved. So, yes. I think too, it's important um, that when we're coming in as professional documentarians, connecting into community processes, that we come from the perspective of participating in the community, right? Um, I'm not a member, for example, of the Historically Black Neighborhood in Swarthmore, but I am a member of Janine's community. We have been community members with one another for a decade, and we are working together from that principle. And um, I, finding a role for myself, finding a role to connect to her efforts is really as simple as having a trusting and solid relationship and building from there saying, you know, what can we do together? Here are the skills that I have. Here are the goals and aims of your community and the skills that you all have. How can um, two plus two equal six? So um, before we sign out tonight, I wanted to also just share with you one more website and I'll ask Leah and um, uh, Nelda to share that in the YouTube chats. Um, we're, I'm not gonna visit it with you today, but I'm just gonna explain a bit. Um, a, co a folklorist colleague of mine, um, Todd Lawrence, um, who's a professor at St. John's University, um, started an archive to document uh, street art commemorating George Floyd. And um, this is a, just a great example of community sourced documentation, um, not wanting to allow a moment to go by where the vast worldwide artistic response to George Floyd's killing um, was created in an ephemeral art form that is graffiti and um, mural and street arts. And so through the resources that he had at his university and working with graduate students, they created an archive online that um, anybody can contribute to. You walking down the street and you see in front of your you know, favorite restaurant that's boarded up, 
uh, a, a mural for Breonna Taylor, a mural for George Floyd, a mural proclaiming Black Lives Matters. And you can snap a photo and upload it um, to this newly created archive. And it's just a really brilliant example of um, a way to ensure that documentation is happening, to source it from um, anybody, from somebody walking down the street with a cell phone. And the impact of that is that these images and this, this moment will not disappear. It will not go undocumented. It will not go unremembered. And um, the effort was so successful that they opened up a second archive. And you'll see that if you navigate to their website, connected to um, uh, street art and COVID-19. And so uh, again, these are just small resources that I'm naming and that I'll share with you after tonight's call um, to help plug you into the possibility of archiving your documentation or working within your own region or within your own city or town to figure out um, the best repository. It could be a shoebox, it could be your local library, or it could be these larger efforts to um, collect movement media that can be then accessed um, by anybody who's working on telling these stories. So um, to wrap up, I just wanted to express my appreciation to you, Janine, um, for sharing your stories and your expertise and experiences tonight. Um, I want to thank so much um, Cynthia, who has been doing an incredible job um, following along in the conversation um, with interpretation, to Alexia, Katja, and Jen, who are translating in Spanish, and um, to We and Goliath team, who has uh, produced tonight's um, video webinar. So, uh, so long, folks. And I uh, look forward to hearing about the projects you're working on as they unfold in the world. Good night. Good night. <laughs>